I'm going to be talking about the imprisonment part of this issue. And I'm obviously coming at it from the perspective of, uh, of a Canadian. And in that sense, I have an easy job, which is that in Canada, criminal law is a federal responsibility, though there, the administration of justice is a provincial and territorial problem. Uh, but in addition, the, the, there's a split between uh, imprisonment, but largely I'm dealing with a single criminal law, a single set of policies across the country. And obviously the issue, or one of the issues that, that we all have to look at is the question of whether we're really talking about 51 different jurisdictions in the United States or one. I'm going to be suggesting that in fact it's probably both. Uh, and what I'm going to try to do is to review in slightly unusual, in a slightly unusual way, the a little bit of the history of why both countries are where they are, and to suggest that issues like crime are important, but the way in which they play out in different countries may, in fact, be very different. Just to give you an overview of what I'm going to be concluding. Uh, I'm going to be suggesting that the big change in the United States that we're all looking at and trying to understand that occurred perhaps in the 1970s, if you're looking at punishment, uh, is really a change in the, in the way in which optimism was operationalized in the, in, in the United States and, in fact, in contrast to Canada. And that, that this change required changes in the way in which offenders were seen, uh, and that this change is very, very different from what happened in Canada. Canada has never been optimistic about the ability of the criminal justice system to control crime through any mechanism whatsoever. And obviously this has implications for how we see uh, what we're going to be getting uh, in the future. I do want to warn you, and the warning is uh, that obviously this is speculative. I am looking at this from, the, from a Canadian perspective, in a sense from afar. I know much more about the Canadian criminal justice system and Canadian criminal justice history than I do about the, uh, about the United States. But in addition, I'm going to be really talking about a kind of policy culture. Uh, and I'm not sure exactly what that is or how to measure it or how even to describe it. The starting point, obviously, is, uh, is imprisonment rate. And what I'm going to be trying to puzzle out is the question that many people have addressed, and that is, what happened in the 1970s? If you go back, this graph goes, happens to go back to 1925, imprisonment rates in the United States uh, are fairly stable until the mid-1970s and then goes up. The, the reddish line is, uh, includes jail data which aren't available until 1980. But what's important is that state imprisonment went up, federal imprisonment went up, and jail imprisonment went up, uh, at least from, the from, 1980s on, from 1980 onwards. So this is a huge change which occurred over, historically, a relatively short period of time. The contrast with that is Canada. And uh, there are a few data fr available from before 1950, but essentially from 1950 until today, the imprisonment rate in Canada has shifted a little bit from time to time from the low 80s per 100, about 82 per 100,000 to about 117 prisoners per 100,000 uh, in the mid-1990s. There have been changes, but within a relatively uh, narrow range. And in a sense, you can say that though there are ups and downs, there's stability. Putting those data together and adding England and Wales to it, you see, again, why we're talking about American exceptionalism. The growth in imprisonment uh, uh, in, in the United States is exceptional. There's growth in Britain, w in England and Wales, uh, which is the bluish line, uh, but that pales in, in size in comparison to the United States. The reddish line is Canada, and when put on the same scale as the United States, you, s you in effect almost don't see the variation that exists. Well, I do have to address this question about uh, whether we're talking about one jurisdiction or 51 different jurisdictions. 
And the overall increase, in a sense, obviously doesn't deal with that. We know that there's been this huge overall increase, but the increase occurs in every single one of the 50 state jurisdictions in the federal jurisdiction. Every one. Uh, the size, on the other hand, varies substantially. And so that the simple conclusion that I might come to would be that really we're talking about both. We're talking about something which happened in the United States and we're talking, in terms of understanding the variation, what happened in each of the states. And when you look at the data, uh, I think that you can see this. These are the uh, states which in the early 1970s had the lowest rates of imprisonment uh, sorry, state imprisonment in the United States. So there's state prisons, not jails. And if you look at the ones that I've outlined in the kind of greenish blue or whatever it is, uh, including Minnesota, interestingly, those, I mean, those are among the 10 states that had the lowest imprisonment rates. But if you look at their imprisonment rates for the more recent period, the, fi the average for the five years from 2006 to 2010, what you see is that uh, there's huge variation. Uh, Minnesota, uh, the, the state imprisonment rate for that average for that period was 182 prisoners per 100,000 in the population. South Dakota was 417. Uh, they're, so they're starting off, these states started off with almost identical uh, imprisonment rates, and yet they, 30 years later, had very different ones. If you look at the states with high imprisonment rates, uh, again, you see the same kind of phenomenon. The ones that are in sort of the yellow uh, have very, very similar imprisonment rates, relatively high for the United States, imprisonment rates from 1971 to 75. But look at their imprisonment rates uh, recently. I mean, they're varying from about 400 to about 650. So there's huge variation, huge change. In that sense, each state is its own story. Uh, I, on the other hand, am not going to be talking about that. What I'm going to be talking about can be seen most easily in this one. These are the 10 states with the, with the lowest absolute change, just the, the difference between their rates in 2006 to 10 minus the earlier rates. And what you see is that the, the state which increased least, which was Maine, increased in absolute terms by 100 new prisoners per 100,000. Uh, so that the change, the absolute changes are, are huge uh, and they're consistent. The least change is a big change, certainly as compared to Canada. Um, the reason I've outlined a few of them in yellow is that those were the states which you saw two, gra two, two uh, slides ago, which are the, sli are the, the, the uh, states with low imprisonment rates in, in the period 1971 to 75. Okay, another way of looking at this consistency is the fact that if you look at the states which had low imprisonment rates, which is that first row, uh, it, the low imprisonment rates from 1971 to 75, they tend to have low imprisonment rates now. So there's consistency. This is an argument that the states really are unique and should be looked at uh, as a uh, individually if you want to understand exactly what's happening in each state. And the states which have high imprisonment rates during the early period tend to have high imprisonment rates later on. Okay, so we've got a complex set of problems to look at. I think it's important to look at crime because you can't look, I think you can't look at imprisonment without looking at what in a in sense directly or indirectly is feeding it. But I think, especially when you think about crime in Canada and the United States, you have to realize that the way in which crime may have influenced or not influenced uh, imprisonment policy is going to vary across the two states. So this is total crime. The, the figures are not comparable. I've, the United States is on the left, Canada is on the right on that. What is total crime varies in the way in which it's counted. That doesn't matter. I've put them on scales to show one single thing, which is that the pattern of crime in the two countries is remarkably similar. Uh, forget about the fact whether the numbers are comparable, the pattern, the up and down pattern 
from the early 1960s until now is remarkably similar. If you want to look at homicide, you see the same thing. This, the United States is on the right. Its homicide rate being, roughly speaking, let's say about three times what Canada is. is. Canada is on the left. The point that I'm trying to make is how similar the crime problems are. Remember that the imprisonment patterns are very different. Just for completeness, if you look at another serious violent crime, robbery, uh, Canada changed its way of counting robbery in the beginning of this century, and therefore there's a little bit of discontinuity there. But essentially, what you see is, again, remarkable similar, remarkably similar patterns of crime. And remember, very different patterns of imprisonment. Now, I'm suggesting that there was maybe is, a kind of optimism about dealing with social problems in Canada that doesn't exist in the United, sorry, in, in the United States that doesn't exist in Canada. And one form of that optimism, which wasn't universal, was indeterminate sentences, that we can figure out what to do and, and figure out how best to deal with, uh, uh, with people who have offended and then return them to, to society. The uh, attorney gen one of the attorneys general for uh, Lyndon Johnson, Ramsey Clark, in a book in 1970, talked about another form of optimism. But look at the words that he's using. You know, talking that there was never a people that was so clearly had the means to solve the problems as Americans do today. I mean, a, an optimism about how to deal with it. What he was optimistic about and how he was optimistic isn't so important. But what he felt was that this was a problem which could be dealt with uh, through policy changes and largely through the criminal justice system. What I'm suggesting, though, changed, is the way in which that optimism played out, the solutions to crime that people felt would work. <coughs> Excuse me, James Q. Wilson in 1975 published a book called Thinking Up About Crime, which many of you probably know about. And what was interesting about it is, again, his optimism about, the, um, about, about how to deal with crime. Now, Wilson, prob I'm suggesting, both reflected and in some important ways influenced criminal justice policy in the United States. But his solution is deterrence and incapacitation. He, and he says, I think somewhat optimistically, that deterrence could, uh, w would, is a good way to, to solve the problem of crime and what you can't deal with that way, you incapacitate. His optimism about those two mechanisms is enormously exaggerated, I would suggest. But nevertheless, what he was suggesting is, here you are, the criminal justice system, it deals with crime, we're going to solve the problem of crime through the criminal justice system a different kind of war. This isn't a new suggestion. Uh, Kevin Wrights and, and, and Henry Ruth, in a, in a book in 2003, talk about Wilson's optimism in the same way. Uh, I think that Michael Tonry, who's never talked about American criminal justice policy in an optimistic way, um, uh, you know, in a sense, talks about it in, in a way which I think you can interpret as optimism because what was being suggested was simplistic, emotional suggestions about how best to deal with crime. The, he's talking about the, cons he's obviously very critical of the conservative view of crime, but nevertheless, the, the, the message that was being communicated, Tonry is pointing out, is one that it's a really simple problem. All we have to do is get together and deal with it. I think the, the height of optimism uh, that I learned about comes from a paper uh, Frank Zimmery and Gordon Hawkins wrote in the 1980s, where they're looking at a National Institute of Justice report on how uh, through deterrence and incapacitation, through incapacitation in particular, uh, uh, crime could be solved. And uh, the, when that report was released, it was talking about you know, that, that we should, shouldn't be so pessimistic, that imprisonment is really too expensive because weighed against the value uh, or the cost of crime and so on, it's, a, it's such a good policy. What Frank Zimmering and Gordon Hawkins did, however, is to take the model seriously and look at it carefully. And what they realized is that by 1987, essentially the time that the report was finally released, according to the model, there'd be zero crime. Now, 
I can't remember 80, 1987, but I suspect that Frank was right that there actually wasn't zero crime in the United States in 1987. But you know, when you think about the notion that the uh, United States National Institute of Justice is, report, is releasing a report saying, you know, we can get crime down substantially. They show that because of the increase in imprisonment, it should have been zero by 1987. I mean, it, it, there really is this, this, this view being suggested that this was a relatively simple problem and that all you needed was uh, the motivation to actually do something about it. Well, if you going to solve the problem of crime through incapacitation and deterrence, you got a problem. And that problem is that you are imprisoning people for deterrence purposes, you're using them as a resource to, uh, to solve the problem of crime for the rest of us. In incapacitation, you're, you're imprisoning them for, pe for reasons uh, of because of crimes that they haven't yet committed. These are remarkable kinds of approaches to punishment. And if you do that, then you have a problem in, in terms of thinking about why it is that you're doing it. And my suggestion is when you do that, you think about people in a different way. And in fact, the justification for it is that the people you're imprisoning are bad people. And that they're in a qualitative way, they're different from the rest of us. Uh, James Whitman, in a in 2000 and I think four book, uh, talks about this and and talks about the, um, the the American tendency toward harsh penalties, not just a lot of punishment, but the harshness of it. I won't read you the quote here, but I think you know the the the. the the idea that respectful treatment has been refused offenders. Uh, and his contrast is with Europe, where he was suggesting, or is suggesting, that, uh, that the, the way in which punishment is carried out is very different. Now, <clears throat> when I thought about that, and thought about this in terms of optimism and so on, it occurred to me that there should be then correlations between different forms of getting rid of people. Uh, and one of them is capital punishment. And it isn't surprising, I suppose from a lot of different perspectives, but it isn't surprising that the capital punishment states tend to have very high imprisonment rates in the United States. Uh, that the states without capital punishment tend to have low imprisonment rates. Well, it makes sense if what you're doing is you're getting rid of people in one, in one of two different ways, uh, and they're kind of interchangeable. You either put them in prison or you execute them. Now, the, the one that I find most, the, I suppose the policy that I find most puzzling looking at it from outside is the policy in a few states uh, to refuse ex-felons the vote. Uh, and what you see here is that those states where ex-felons cannot vote uh, are overly, I mean, are dramatically the high imprisonment states. Again, it fits the, mo the, the suggestion that I'm making that the people who you're using as a resource to stop crime or you're getting rid of in one way or another are really less than full citizens. And so that even if they do ever get out, uh, they shouldn't be allowed to vote forever. I mean, I've, as I said, I find it a remarkable kind of policy. And it, 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 but on, in the context of what I'm talking about, it isn't terribly surprising that those states that refuse some ex-prisoners the vote are those states that have high imprisonment rates. OK, I've talked a lot about <coughs> um, a country I know less about, I'll turn to one that I know a little bit more about, and that is Canada. Canada's had a proportional sentencing policy uh, for decades. It was first legislated in 1996. The Supreme Court of Canada shortly afterwards pointed out that this was really just putting in legislation uh, for uh, a practice that had existed for a long time. Uh, and it's the, the, a kind of proportional model in sentencing has been accepted um, as, uh, as, as guiding sentencing for, for it, it's really a, an uncontroversial policy. But what isn't an, what, what is also consistent 
besides a proportional model of sentencing, is that uh, Canadians have always been pessimistic about the ability of the criminal justice system to solve the problems of crime. Uh, I've been reading old reports about, uh, about uh, Canadian criminal justice policy for a number of years. And this is a, a sort of typical one. <coughs> it's, it's sort of interesting from another, from one perspective, which is that the, the, the system was as the, the, when the Superior Court would move into a town, it, would, it rotated around, they would, there would be a formal opening of the courts and often the Chief Justice would, would have a statement to the community about crime or about the courts or whatever it was. The Chief Justice of Upper Canada, in a completely uncontroversial way, talks about how it, it, it isn't the severity of punishment that's going to do anything about crime. Uh, the language is... is wonderfully mid-19th century, talking about the, the way to prevent crime is through the religious and moral instruction, uh, but rather than through the criminal justice system. Our prime minister was quite similar. Our first prime minister was quite, uh, was a, actually had practiced criminal law. He never saw severity of punishment as a criminal lawyer, as a solution. Um, he, you know, talked about quite quite openly the fact that severe sentences weren't going to do anything uh, about crime. When we did finally open a formal penitentiary in, in, in 1835 in Canada, almost immediately there was concern about unduly harsh treatment of inmates. And in a, what you'll see is a t was a typical uh, Canadian way. There was an inquiry into this, uh, finding that there was unduly harsh treatment and trying to do something about it. We have royal commissions from the f founding of Canada in 1867 onwards at regular uh, intervals that deal with criminal justice policy. 1914, a royal commission on penitentiary, just in a fairly straightforward way, dismissed the idea that harsh treatment is going to deter. I uh, talked about punishment and penitentiaries in a way that essentially was saying that, that they are uh, necessary evils. Um, it recommended, and this is sort of an interesting problem, it recommended in indeterminate sentences. Uh, indeterminate sentences were recommended a number of times by uh, important people and commissions in Canada, and they never stuck, in a sense. We have indeterminacy in terms of a discretionary parole, but not, a, not in, in, a, in an important way indeterminate sentences. In the uh, 1930s, there was another royal commission looking at the penal system, uh, and again, a kind of pessimism, a typical Canadian pessimism about the ability of the criminal justice system to do anything, in this case saying that the penitentiaries, in effect, make people worse. These were not, at the time, seen as controversial. My favorite, which I put in largely because of the, 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 the title of the uh, committee that dealt with it, what dealt with it was the, the joint committee, it was of the House of Commons and the Senate of Canada. Uh, we were trying to be efficient, I guess, of putting capital punishment, corporal punishment, and lotteries uh, together as a subject of uh, inquiry. Capital punishment, uh, ca Canada had capital punishment at the time. The committee, which was of legislators was reluctant to uh, get rid of, of capital punishment. It was effectively abolished very shortly thereafter. The last prisoner was executed in Canada in 1962 and it was formally abolished uh, in 1977. Corporal punishment was more interesting because corporal punishment, there was a relatively small amount of corporal punishment in two forms. One was uh, the lashing of prisoners as part of their sentences and the use of whipping in our penitentiaries. And there was <coughs> the legislators, when they looked at that in the mid-1950s, uh, felt quite clearly that this was, as they said, out of step with modern penal theory. Uh, it wasn't formally abolished uh, until later. It, it, the last evidence it was ever used was in 1968 and was formally abolished in 1972. Uh, I won't bore you with what they said about lotteries. Um, <coughs> the, the, again, I, can, I will be going through these things really to show you the, the, the way in which uh, 
Canadians have, have viewed the criminal justice system. Probably the most important uh, report of the, of the uh, kind of mid to late uh, 20th century was a, a report called the Canadian C uh, Committee on Corrections. And it, uh, again, when it, it talked about the, you know, it questioned the effectiveness of deterrent techniques, it talked segregation, which really is incapacitation, saying that it was erratic and irrational, uh, and the view that imprisonment should be used only as the ultimate, you know, as the ultimate penalty and should be used uh, rarely, or more rarely, uh, was expressed there as it was in many other kinds of, of reports. <coughs> um, in, in 1972, um, it, in, there was a debate in Parliament uh, talking about punishment, uh, talking about po uh, policies for, for Canada's penitentiaries. Uh, and what I found interesting in that debate, it was an important debate and was referred to a number of times later on. A debate is really the wrong word, however, which was the Solicitor General of Canada made a formal statement about policies in, in re about, about our penitentiaries. And then there was a reply by the Conservatives. Um, and the, but what was important, I think, was the tone. And the tone was... Um, uh, I think captured by the a part of the quotation which I put in red, which is an inmate is always a citizen who sooner or later is going to return to a normal life. Now the, the conservative critic got up immediately afterwards and was gently critical uh, of the Solicitor General, not for being kind of soft on prisoners, but rather for saying good things and not doing anything about it. And uh, among other things, he was gently critical of the government for not giving, uh, at that time, federal prisoners the vote. Uh, federal prisoners and judges were not allowed to vote in Canada at that time. And he thought that prisoners should be allowed to vote. He was a little bit less sure about judges. Um, I can go through other reports. I mean, as, as the... As the uh, 20th century went on, I think the, the concern about the overuse of imprisonment became more explicit. So the Law Reform Commission of Canada in its first report to, Can to the Canadian Parliament talked about the harsher the penalty, the slower we should be to use it. A House of Commons committee uh, uh, made uh, similar kinds of statements about the penitentiary system. Uh, there were policy statements in the 1980s uh, where the government released a formal criminal justice policy. And what you begin to see in that period of time is references to the United States. So in 1984, there was uh, criticism. The government was criticizing its own incarceration rate and saying it looked restrained only in comparison to the United States, Soviet Union, and South Africa. Uh, the Canadian Sentencing Commission, uh, in dealing with the problem of, of deterrence and incapacitation, uh, made a sort of smart-ass remark, uh, which judges weren't terribly happy about, uh, you know, saying that you don't turn to judges to solve the problems of crime. But other than a few people who thought that that was disrespectful of judges, it was an uncontroversial kind of statement. Uh, probably the, the, the single statement which captures most of this is the one at the, uh, the, the bottom one, which is from, this is from the Minister of Justice and Solicitor General of Canada. It's a joint statement that they made. The Minister of Justice, Kim Campbell, uh, went on to, for a short time, to be um, Canada's first uh, woman prime minister. Uh, but, you know, it's a statement that imprisonment is generally viewed of, as of limited use in, in controlling uh, crime through deterrence, incapacitation, and reformation. I mean, it wasn't, it, it, what, there was a view that this just wasn't the way to do things. Uh, and that statement, as with other government statements, if you went, we went back and looked at newspapers, there was almost no coverage of them. Uh, there was no coverage because these were uncontroversial statements. Uh, there's a House of Commons committee 
talks about, you know, if you're looking to imprisonment, in fact, that the United States affords a glaring example of the limited impact that criminal justice responses may have on crime. Um, again, the United States at this point then becoming the reference point for criticism. So you, you see the United States, remember those graphs, the United States imprisonment rates going up dramatically. Canadian imprisonment rate, this is 1993, was almost at its all-time high. It had been going up slowly but steadily until the, uh, uh, through this period for about 20 years so that there was concern in the government about what we're going to be doing about it. There are various other committees, which I won't talk about, which were trying to address these things. Uh, the clearest example recently of this, though, comes from the what I would refer to as the legislative pessimism about criminal justice solutions to social problems, which came out when we brought in a new a uh, youth justice law in 2003. And this youth justice law talks about, the, in, the pre, in the preamble talks about the overuse of youth justice, of the formal youth justice system, and the overuse of incarceration, uh, especially for nonviolent kids. Uh, and suggested that if, you know, wherever possible, uh, there should be attempts to solve these kinds of issues completely outside of the formal system. Uh, the sentencing system for our, youth, our national youth justice law uh, originally did not include deterrence. It does now in a peculiar, uh, probably unimportant way. It talked about proportionality. Rehabilitation was, in a sense, allowed, but it was limited by proportionality. You couldn't give harsher sentences for rehabilitation, or cannot give harsher sentences for rehabilitative purposes. Uh, there were limited uses of, of custody. Uh, and essentially, a custodial sentence could not explicitly could not be given for the youth's own good. It was criticized in various ways, interestingly, for being too harsh. Now, what happened when that law came in in 2003 is that the youth, use of the youth justice system dropped dramatically, just as the law was as had been designed to do. The use of custody dropped dramatically, so that the proportion of kids who were sent to custody um, and the rate of sending to custody dropped dramatically. Uh, in my own province, which had overused custody more than almost any other province, uh, when the law came in, there had been a declining use of custody, and when, there, when the law came in, uh, the use of custodial sentences for kids dropped down. Now, I don't want to give you the view that everything is great about the Canadian criminal justice system, because it certainly never has been and never was and certainly isn't now. Uh, and since 2006, uh, we've had a conservative government which is very different from the conservative governments of the past. If I were to line up a set of quotes, I didn't even bother to tell you hardly when, when these things were conservative governments and liberal governments in the history of Canada, because it didn't matter. They were indistinguishable. Since 2006, we've had a law and order government, and we, for five years we had a minority government, now there's a majority government. Then, and they have moved in an interesting way toward deterrence and incapacitation and toward the devaluing of offenders. Uh, their solution to the problems of crime are min mandatory minimum sentences, constraints on the release of imprisonment, constraints in making it more difficult for various reasons to get, for people to get pardons, uh, to, to have their criminal records, in a sense, suppressed. Um, and the view is now that the, just, the criminal justice system works and offenders are bad people, something which is obviously quite similar. Now, what, what's interesting is that that hasn't translated, at least yet, into higher rates of imprisonment. Our imprisonment rates have been going up sort of a little bit each year during this century. There's no discontinuity when these laws came into effect. Uh, they are, from an American perspective, typically watered down. But, what, but the problem is, is that there are lots of them. Uh, and there are reasons why there are so many bills, that were, crime bills, that were introduced. But if you look at this, you see that the, in the last seven years, there have been 16 separate uh, sentencing bills, 25 different crime bills that have been passed by our parliament, all of which, 
uh, I would see as kind of marketing of criminal justice solutions uh, to crime. So Canada is certainly moving and in, in a direction that, uh, that you would all be familiar with. But I think in general, uh, I mean, it, the, the level of optimism, at least until 2006, about the criminal justice system's ability to deal with these problems is very different in Canada and the United States. We have been, for centuries, pessimists about the ability to solve this particular, the, the crime problem through the criminal justice system. Now we also do have, and I mean this seriously, an, an advantage of not being American and being able to, <clears throat> to look to the United States and look at a, a country that is struggling with a, a set of problems, be both crime and imprisonment problems, which are different from ours. Uh, Seymour Lipset has a sort of smart-ass quote about this, but I think that there's something to this, saying that Canadians have, have uh, felt that there's not something not quite right uh, with the United States. But the history in Canada is consistent. Uh, and what, of course, we're thinking about is what will happen as the sort of shine comes off of, of U.S. imprisonment. Uh, what will happen as Canadians are looking to imprisonment, or at least the government is looking to imprisonment as the problem. Uh, and I leave you with a question is, you know, is Canada adopting U.S. optimism, or are we really just looking for ways to market uh, the government? So thank you very much. <coughs> Okay, we'll take questions. Uh, my name is George Johnson. I, I couldn't help but um, notice there is some, uh, or seemingly there is some uh, interrelationship between maybe the state's GDP and imprisonment rates. Uh, I, I was thinking along the lines of basically what people have to do uh, constructively versus non-constructively and that relationship in a state or a given region or entity. Yeah, I, look, if you look at the states, I mean, if, um, if you look at the states which either in the early 1970s or, in, uh, or now have high imprisonment rates, they're different states. I mean, the, you know, you, it's the, the, the northern, I mean, the, the ones with relatively low state, low uh, imprisonment rates are the northern states. Um, the, the ones with the, the southern and some of the western states are the ones with high imprisonment rates. They vary on a whole bunch of different dimensions. Uh, others can talk about, better than I can, about uh, GDP, for example. But I think what's important, and this is, this is why I think that, that whatever it is that I'm saying, it's dealing with only a part of the story. And it's not dealing with that variation. Because that variation is huge. I mean, the, the, but, but what still s surprises me is that states like Minnesota, which are still moderate, relatively speaking, uh, still went up so much. I mean, Kevin uh, writes in his, in his introductory remarks, you know, pointed out that crime rates are, are sort of similar to what they were in the 1960s, but we don't have imprisonment rates that are like that. And what's going on there? So I agree with you. I mean, I, I'm not sure what it is that explains the differences in, um, in American imprisonment rates across states. What is what I suppose I'm focusing on much more is why everybody seemed to go up. Now, they didn't all start exactly in the same year um, in, their, in the rise of imprisonment, why they all went up in the 1970s. Yeah. I'm Bob Johnson, and I'm a former prosecutor. And I'd like your view uh, on the issue of the degree to which the prosecution function and the elective nature of judges and prosecutors in the states, the decentralization of the prosecution function in the states has contributed to the incarceration issue and, and whether, if I heard you correctly, 
even though you have the levers of the criminal justice system being changed in Canada, it perhaps hasn't ramped up to the degree that it has in the States, and is that different construct of the judicial and prosecution function in the States uh, a contributing factor? Um, I, I, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm quite sure that it is a contributing factor. Our prosecutors are civil servants uh, appointed by the um, attorneys general of each of the provinces. So most of our prosecutors are provincial or territorial prosecutors. The, the, there, are, there is also laid on top of that some uh, offenses which are prosecuted by federal prosecutors, but largely uh, Ninety percent of the offenses are, are, are prosecuted by provincial offenses. What's interesting about them is that they're under policy control of the provinces. And the provinces have a number of different concerns, uh, included in which is money. Sixty percent of our prisoners are, are housed in uh, provincial institutions. So there is a real concern about that. Uh, but I think also the, I mean, they are appointed, they are in effect appointed as civil servants for life. Uh, they're not worried about those things. They're not worried about their jobs. They're not worried about elections. Uh, and they take, um, they take their, their direction from each province. So at the moment, for example, in my own province, there's concern about the prosecutorial process, that our courts have become very inefficient, and the courts are dealing with a, a large number of minor kinds of offenses. The central office of the Ministry of Attorney General of Ontario it has, a, uh, has developed a set of policies to minimize uh, the prosecution of minor kinds of offenses, to basically to take them out of the system. How is that? How is that imposed on the prosecutors? It's policy. So there are various ways. They're, they're, it's, a, it's a kind of light-handed policy. They're trying to cajole the, poli the, the prosecutors into uh, screening cases out and not have, and having full prosecutions for a lot of different things. Uh, but it's, it's policy. I mean, you can go to the website of the Ministry of Attorney General of Ontario and see this. And they have, you know, it, it is... It is, a, a, it is control of the Attorney General, the, and probably more importantly, the senior officials within that ministry. So the senior civil servants, the deputy, the associate deputy ministers, the uh, people who are in charge of criminal law policy in the province who are making these decisions, and then those policies get, get filtered down. And, and the incentives clearly are to follow the policies. So that they, I mean, they are central. The, the, probably the, the best example that I have of uh, the importance of the way in which these things are done and the way in which they, they, it, it sort of levels down is that the most conservative province in Canada, Alberta, in the early 1990s had a budget problem. And the premier, uh, premier cut budgets. He cut everybody's budget by 20%. Now, that's a huge budget cut for anybody. The Justice Ministry uh, at that point had come together to a single ministry, so it involved prosecutions, a little bit of police, but not really very much, uh, but prosecutions and, and courts and corrections. And the Deputy Minister had no choice but to reduce and be selective in the way in which they reduced imprisonment, so that the the way in which he did that was to set up a policy for his prosecutors. And it was absolutely clear, it was unambiguous, it was celebrated when it was successful. And the Minister of Justice got up and said, isn't it great, we have fewer people in prison, we're prosecuting fewer people and crime hasn't changed. And so, you know, all of that was possible because of that kind of central control. And, and the, the uh, Deputy Minister of Justice in, in Alberta at the time was a longtime civil servant, uh, civil servant all of his life. He had no problems in doing it. His first thing was to close a prison. Um, and closing a prison 
sort of focused attention on, on a whole bunch of different things, including his prosecutors on what they can do. So I think it, it, it is important. Uh, it, it, it is an important difference. And it makes these kinds of changes more possible. Could you please, please introduce yeah. yourself when you yeah. ask your question. Yeah. Um, Mark Bliven from the Minnesota Department of Corrections. Um, I, I do think that the, the, the statement, your ending statement there about the shine coming off the U.S. system, uh, is it all about money? It does seem to be that, that there's nothing driving it, that the policies are not changing. And if, if policymakers could come up with a way of making incarceration cheaper in, in the U.S., and yeah. I think the same thing has affected Canada, if you can figure out how to incarcerate more people, at a cheaper price, you know, and we always have these ideas like double bunking and triple bunking and and things like that, which aren't necessarily cheaper, but uh, that is seems to be the driving force, and it seems to be the driving force now in Canada too. Um, you know, I, I'm confused about what's happening in Canada right now, and let me give an example of it, which is that the first. Uh, two bills. One of, the, one of the first two bills that the government of the present government introduced on crime right after it was elected was announced as as imposing five-year mandatory minimum penalties on serious violent crimes involving firearms. And you know, the the national newspaper, all of the newspapers talked about these new five-year penalties. And I sat there watching this in complete disbelief as to people's ignorance because we'd had a four-year mandatory minimum penalty for uh, 10 years at that point. And so we had four years, and they were raising it to five years, but only if the, f if, the, um, if the offense was carried out with a handgun or what we call a prohibited weapon, essentially a machine gun. And, and, um, and they're raising it from four years to five years. So it's a very, it's a, it, it's a sort of small thing. Now they got away with making it sound tougher than it was by raising it only that little bit. Um, and, and, and ignoring the fact that, by describing that they were gonna impose five year mandatory minimums rather than that they're raising it from four to five. So, you know, I don't know what Canada's doing in that. I think that a lot of it is selling um, the, uh, uh, is selling so themselves as doing something to make us all safe. I mean, some of these bills that they've put in are complete nonsense. They will affect almost nobody. I mean, there's one bill that we know quite well, starting in 15 years, will affect about three people a year, but it's not going to come into effect for 15 years because of people who are already in the system. Well, why did they get rid of it? Because it's wonderfully symbolic that they're going to toughen up on murderers. On, on the release of murderers. So I don't know what's happening in Canada in that way. Uh, one of the things which does keep, you know, which puts a restraint on, the, on, on our federal government who has responsibility for the criminal law is that the provinces get furious when things are gonna cost them money because all of our provinces are in debt, or are running, sorry, are, have debts and are running deficits. And so, the, the provinces are saying, we, we can't afford these kinds of things. Now, the provinces have a lot of power to control their local imprisonment. Alberta, when it reduced its imprisonment, reduced it in three years. Sorry, in three years, they reduced it by 30%. So they have the powers to do these. Um, you know, I don't know whether it's just money. I mean, I think that part of the... Part of the, the underlying set of values is that this isn't really a good way to do things. The professional uh, approach to it, when I talk to people in corrections, they don't want more prisons. They're very happy to be closing down prisons. They don't see it as an important way of, of solving the crime problem. They don't like double bunking, and in that sense, would like to, to deal with their overcrowding problems. But they... Um, but they're not seeing it as a solution. So the change which has occurred since 2006 is that we have a very powerful group, namely the government of Canada, who is saying, you're gonna solve the problems of crime through punishment. That's, that's a change. And 
And what I don't know is whether they're just doing that because it's such an easy sell or whether they truly believe it. I sort of half have the feeling that it's mainly for marketing purposes. Tony, Ke Kevin writes, I, I, have a, I have a question about uh, uh, disparities in punishment. A, a lot of people who tell the story or, or try to think about American exceptionalism would say that, well, a, a lot of it comes from our history of slavery and Jim Crow and racial uh, division. And I, I, you know, I, I, I really enjoy your paper and the, 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 the differences that you point out between Canada and the United States. But uh, when, when, when I look at the issue of disparity in Canada, disparity in sentencing, I, I, I see some similarities. And I know you know this, I know you've worked on this issue, but in, in, the, in the federal and provincial prisons, the aboriginal incarceration rate is between seven and eight times that of white, Canadian, white, white Canadians. And I believe in one of the provinces in Saskatchewan, it was 35 to one or something. So, so, I, so I wonder if, if, if this is one area that, is, is, is this an area where, the, where, where, where there are big differences between the two countries? Or in some ways, might there be commonalities where we are both dealing with a, a problem of disproportionality in sentencing that, 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 that we share in some sense? Um, yeah, I, the, the, uh, I'll address the issue of, of, of race. Um, directly, and, and <clears throat> what's interesting about the overrepresentation of Aboriginal people, but also of blacks in in parts of Canada where there are substantial uh, black um, uh, communities, uh, is that especially with Aboriginal people, it has been seen as a problem uh, for decades. Um, so that the you know in 1996 when when Canada first legislated uh, sentencing, it's kind of a, a, there's a sentencing part, a real sentencing part with principles and purposes and so on of, <coughs> of sentencing uh, into the criminal code. In those, in those 1996 uh, amendments, there was a, there's a clause which says that all possible um, punishments you know, other than imprisonment should be considered before imprisonment uh, is this a result of what I've said? <laughs> uh, um, uh, or um, with the special, with, I can't remember exactly what the wording is, but with special recognition to the, to the position of Aboriginal people. And so, you know, the, the, there's an understanding explicit in, in this section of the code that Aboriginal people are overrepresented. That clause in the criminal code as far as I can tell, had zero impact. And it had zero impact, I think, because um, it's not so much a, it's, it's not so much a, a thing which, it's not a problem which can be solved at sentencing. It's a problem which is much more basic than that. The, the problem of Aboriginal people in Canada itself, quite outside of the criminal justice system, has been seen as a huge embarrassment um, since at least the 1950s that I've been able to track it back. I mean, it's, it's the position of Aboriginal people in our, in our society because of what Canadian majority society did to them uh, is, is absolutely clear. So we, we see it in the prison thing, and, and largely the governments have you know, acknowledged it and sort of fiddled with little things like putting a thing saying you have to look especially careful for alternatives to imprisonment for Aboriginal people. Uh, they fiddled with it a little bit by having um, a by having certain kinds of prison system, you know, by programs in prisons and so on, but never really come to grips with it because I don't think it's largely an, a a a criminal justice problem. Uh, it's, it's reflecting a much more serious underlying problem. If it were just criminal justice, it would be easy. But getting back to the broader issue, I mean, the, the disparities that, that come up in, in, in general, uh, we have left to the courts, as you know. I mean, we've never been sympathetic with anything which involves guidelines. Uh, the Canadian Sentencing Commission in 1987 recommended guidelines, and by, you know, within a few months, I think that the, on, 
the only people who were in favor of them were the nine commissioners. So you know, it's a uh, so we've we've ne we've always relied on judges. Courts of appeal have been very active in Canada in terms of trying to deal with these kinds of issues, trying to deal with disparity issues generally. Um, and uh, the courts of appeal have felt it's really their responsibility more than the government to deal with it. Okay, we've got about four minutes left. If we have some quick questions and fairly quick responses, we can fit in two more. Okay. Uh, good morning. My name is Mark Hazi. I'm with the Council on Crime and Justice, a local community organization. Um, I have a quick clarifying question before I ask my main question. Is it true that Canada um, expanded the right to vote to inmates in 2002? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in, in 2002, uh, after a long, protracted, circuitous um, route through the court system, the, um, the Canadian Supreme Court gave uh, federal prisoners the vote. Every, the provincial prisoners who, had, um, who uh, constitute 60% of, of our prisoners had always had the right to vote. And in 2002, federal prisoners were given the right to vote. I just, I, I found that interesting in contrasting it to the U.S. policy, um, like you've already done, that, um, you know, in 2002, we were at, you know, essentially the peak of our uh, tough on crime movement, uh, maybe yeah. just slightly past it, and to have something like that happen here is just unthinkable, and it's, it's currently unthinkable, and to me, that reflects a little bit more than just a pessimism you know, Canada's position on that, more than a pessimism about the ef efficacy of the criminal justice system, but of a different view of inmates' rights and, and, and who they are. Well, before, I, you know, it, I think you have to look a little bit at, at the way in which that happened. I mean, we, our Charter of Rights in 1980 was brought in 1982. Our Charter of Rights explicitly gives all citizens the right to vote. So why in 1982, not, not 2002, didn't federal prisoners get the right to vote? Well, the argument was, well, this, we have a provision in our Charter which says that, that uh, the, the constraints on those freedoms you know, are sort of in keeping with the, the practices in free and democratic societies. So the argument was made, well, it's a perfectly reasonable constraint, among other things, because it's done in so many parts of, of the United States. And so it took from 1982 to 2002, and then it was a four to three split, or five to four split in the Supreme Court of Canada in that case. So it was a, you know, it was a victory in the sense that the right decision was made. But it wasn't an easy victory. It should have been, it seemed to me, in 1982, the end of the story. It's not a big deal. And the Supreme Court of Canada came out with this very, you know, sensible kind of thing about where they vote. So that Kingston, Ontario, where all our penitentiaries are largely, uh, wasn't going to be a prisoner vote. I mean, they, they said you, you're voting from where you came, essentially. So we're technically past time, but we've had one very patient questioner who I'd like to, to let ask her question. Thank you. My name is Lejeune Lang. I'm a retired judge. And you were asked earlier about the impact of having to be elected to office as a prosecutor or a judge. And in Canada, I think it would be instructive if you would tell us about the case of the either the magistrate or judge from Nova Scotia in the mid-90s who dared to speak out about uh, racial disparities in sentencing and criticized the conduct of the police. And she was a uh, black Canadian at the time. Uh, I, uh, sorry, but I actually don't know that story. But uh, our judges are, the, the difficulty is that our judges, um, though they're appointed, um, they're appointed by the government, they're appointed by two different governments. Some of them are appointed by provincial governments and some are appointed by the federal government. Um, there are constraints on them in terms of what they can talk about, and the provincial or the national judicial councils um, uh, do con do constrain them. So that uh, you know the, the the argument traditionally in Canada, I made a joke earlier about uh, federal federal judges not being able to vote uh, until relatively recently, until about the 1980s. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is this tradition that as soon as a person is, is appointed, they, um, they, they are not supposed to engage themselves in political matters. So it's, 
I, you know, as I said, I don't know the particular case, uh, but I think that the, the tradition is, uh, it has its downfall, which is it, or has its pitfalls, which is that if you have a system where judges aren't supposed to be political, uh, there are consequences of speaking out. So that I know, for example, it's very rare for Canadian judges ever to speak about uh, public matters, um, in part because of, of this kind of notion about the separation. Okay. Thank you so much, Professor Duke. Thank you.